first of all, thanks for your time. It's um, uh, yeah, we go back a, a little bit already, a few years. Yes, sure. we do. And um, yeah, since I think just crossed my mind that we we met, I think through my uh, and your friend uh, Frederick Stada, actually. That's right, He's Frederick. Ma yeah. yeah, mastering engineer, vinyl cutter. Um, used to be based uh, in Berlin, and we shared a studio for a few years, a mastering studio. Yeah. And then he moved back to Cologne and he, um, I think he introduced us uh, somewhere around like three years ago. Um, That's so right. Yes. Yeah. And he used to be in the group Dynasty too on, on Warp yep. Records. Yes. And then he yes, did exactly. some music on Schematic. No. Um, no. Yeah, he, he's done lots of great music. I was yeah. a fan of his music early on. He played many parties with us back in. Yeah let's say the mid 2000s with my friend Ram and Josh when we were throwing parties in Miami we had we had him come out many times and yeah, um, yeah he's a great musician yeah really, great really... musician and really one of the few really really exceptionally great uh, vinyl cutters in Germany I think right now so yes so yeah, this, I, I... this kind of stuff uh, a lot actually whereas yeah, I, I, um, I uh, had to make a decision a few years back and uh, decided to go all the way uh, towards the, the company and really try try cut, ha, had to decide that mastering will remain a great hobby but I, that i couldn't pursue it full time because running the company uh, uh, like that is, is obviously taking up most of my time right now yeah. oh i can't imagine yeah i mean yeah i mean mastering is one of those things that i do as a hobby i'm i'm, yeah. I'm not a mastering engineer but i like to try to master my own music because it's so weird and and strange and um, although I did have another mastering engineer help me out on my last record, but yeah, yeah, it's always good to get a second pair of ears on it, but it's something I'm like always fascinated with. I'm like fascinated with that final end stage of finishing and polishing, yeah. um, yeah. you know, a product. And it's, uh, something that got overlooked so many times in a lot of my work, like as a mm -hmm. sound designer, a lot of companies would skip out on that. They wouldn't master the product before it went to TV or or it went you know into some other product or some environment. Yeah. Um, it was very different when you work as like a sound designer making content than when you're making music. When you're making music, you want it yeah. to sound universally good everywhere. But if you're making sound effects or sound for like a product that may just get played in that product and one specific speaker, they don't even think about exactly. No, I don't. They think... don't think about it. But yeah. it was something that yeah. I thought about. I was like, well, I'm going to master this material to make sure it sounds the best that it can sound on this small speaker or this big speaker or whatever the device was you yeah. know whether it was a car or you know i you yeah. know it, i've worked on so many weird projects that that was always something that they the, the the clients would forget about or leave out but it was something that i was consciously thinking of that you know that should probably be <laughs> we should probably figure that out or i should figure that out um, yeah, so think... that they don't have I think this 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 open gap kind of uh, I think justify like was was a good opportunity for companies like Landar who who introduced um, mm -hmm. algorithmical um, oriented mastering for which is actually really good for radio jingles for all these kind of bits and pieces where where you, we're not talking about a record and an album that has a finish that a beginning and a finish and. Um, but I was I'm, I was always wondering, even in, in the in the years that I've mastered pretty much full time, I was always wondering, what am I really uh, paid for? What is the what is the, the actual benefit of a mastering engineer? And uh, I always come back to that conclusion that it's actually the experience that someone brings in, no matter what gear he or she is using, no matter what um, what the circumstances are. But it's because I've always asked myself. Like someone like you, for an example, or people who actually um, produce and mix their own music, um, wouldn't it be the most obvious if with the same skill sets and even the same kind of gear, and I know you have some serious mastering gear in your um, studio, wouldn't it be the mm -hmm. most obvious to take that last steps also in, in your hands? And Absolutely. Um, so it was always because there, there has been this you know, mystical, like mastering is like the, the black magic, the black voodoo of, uh, <laughs> of audio production, but it's actually, um, I don't really think so at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. yeah it doesn't, it's not something that has to be complicated. Um, mm -hmm. 
I always felt like that guy. There's this guy I follow on Instagram, Streaky. Do you know Streaky? From yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love his videos where he's like, you're overthinking this. It's not like, because, yeah. and he's right. Because I remember when I went and did mastering for my first Warp album at Townhouse in London, when mm -hmm. I got to sit in with the mastering engineer and we went through all my tracks. I remember, you know, looking at all the outboard stuff and, you know, I was thinking that it was this, crazy complicated process like they were like analyzing things and like but no they were just trying to get stuff to sound good the the, the result was just to get it do universally sound good pretty much anywhere you play it whether you're playing it in your car you're playing it on yeah. a boom box your sonos wi-fi speakers or mm -hmm. you know they're just trying to get represent the best representation of your track to sound is decent on as many yeah, platforms exactly. as possible that's really yeah and sometimes it's really is sometimes it's really not like that much of a big deal. And I think it probably takes some experience and some, some belief in your skills to understand that in some situations you don't need to push a signal through like a $5,000 compressor or you don't even have to, in some cases, you don't even have to convert it and bring it into the analog realm because you're so close to the actual result that a few t tweaks here and there in the box might already do the trick. Um, Exactly. And I've done that many times where I was just like, well, I mean, I've got Poltec compressors. I mean, I've got Poltec EQs. Compressing I could either EQs. use the, yeah. you know, I could use those, my real ones, or I could use the plug-in ones, you know, mm. and there would be cer circumstances when the plug-in was better to use and the, the hardware. And, you yeah. know, like for me, I'm not a purist in any way. I, I purely work to what's most, um, you know, I guess fun for me because I like I like having real knobs and stuff. Yeah. That's why I bought my my uh, a lot of my upboard mastering gear and a lot of things that I noticed that I do when I work inside the box. I felt were like bad habits. I get into these bad habits where mm -hmm. I'll recall up my favorite master mastering bus plug and chain setup, or I'll have my favorite, you know. Um, preset settings for certain multiband compressors or EQs and stuff. And, and for me, that's cool, but that kind of ma always makes it where I'm using the same sound over again. I kind of get the same type of sound, same type, type of mix, which isn't a bad thing if you find some sweet spots, but I felt with working with the hardware, it's kind of like the modular, I'd start fresh every time. Yes. You know, mm. you can recall settings and recall your stuff, but I, I yeah. like being able to like find and not look at a screen just like use my ears and just kind of tweak knobs and mm. flip some switches and like yeah. really really zero in and find that perfect space where i feel like you can find that perfect snapshot of all the settings right for that track or whatever the project is yeah. and um, i mean i feel it and in your case there's so much hardware involved in the actual process of music production that it comes very natural to to see um, de devices like analog eqs and compressors as you know, crucial part of the chain is like the long arm of the of the actual uh, module that m might play a role in a, in a specific situation. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's funny because we're getting into this whole mastering thing now. We didn't even mention your new record, and <laughs> we kind of <laughs> taking it backwards now. <laughs> so at oh, the no, end of the talk, totally I will. <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> no. Um, but what was the mastering process like in this particular new record that comes out on November 11? And then we can probably get into that also a little bit. Yeah. Um, this record was much easier to mix than my previous album, Sort Lave, which was a real pain in the butt to yeah. master. There was a lot more tracks involved um, with that and just the whole process of how to link everything together and how to hook everything up and into my system was, was very tricky. This last record was much easier. Was, there was only, I want to say, at most five, six sound sources going at once, eight mm -hmm. at, at the most, maybe eight tracks, um, because I use just a ER8S Roland drum machine, um, two TB303s that had yeah. a um, H9 effects processors that I was using with them. And then I had a small Eurorack system that was doing a lot of glitchy sampling drums and manipulation. I had a couple of um, just smaller modules in there as well. So I really used a very minimal setup for this record because the whole yeah. concept was um, well, it was my live show, basically. I was going to play this new live show this year. Um, I only got to play two shows. I played one show in LA in January, and then I played another show where, where I opened up for Dan Deacon at Bridie mm -hmm. Playhouse, and it was it was sold out. It was like 2,500 people at the show, mm -hmm. and um, 
uh, was the last show before the COVID-19 shut everything down. But that show went really well. Actually, both shows went really well. The response was like overwhelming. People were mm -hmm. just like, oh my God, you should. Um, it's a bummer that you can't play that, that set out anymore. Mm -hmm. At least that music as uh as like a record and i really had no intentions of releasing these tracks these were going to be never released i was just going to play them out live and because mm. uh, i already have two two hours of new music outside mm. of this that i want to release um that's that's going to come out probably next year so this was kind of like one of those unexpected uh releases um that kind of just popped up because yeah. of the because of the way things have gone this year and and of course two friends of mine pushing me to to release it as well they were like no we have these tracks have to come out and i was like no i didn't really ever want these to come out this is just you know for people to experience in a live show setting so well why don't mm. you record the record as like a live like a live acid record and i was like oh that's an interesting that was an interesting concept mm. um me more interested i was like okay as long as i'm doing something completely different than my previous record, I'll, 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 it might be a fun experiment just to see what happens. So that's what I did. I set up everything just as if I was going to perform the show live, yeah. uh, like I did the two other sets. Mm -hmm. And I basically recorded the entire live show in one take. Yeah. So it was like 40, 40 originally it was like 48 minutes, um, or actually the, the original set was closer to an hour, but I cut things down because I knew we were going to release it on the vinyl. And for vinyl for it to sound optimally good as you know you you want to keep things close to around 20 minutes per side so yeah. i knew i had to cut cut down some things so i edited yeah. some of the sequences and then i kind of scrunched it down to about 40 minutes for the vinyl and then uh cut cut some of the tracks digitally in sequoia this uh editing software that i have here too yeah um Lots of mastering yeah. engineers actually use that. Mastering engineers, yeah. 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 Um, Sequoia 15, mm -hmm. I used to cut through the tracks and then um, for so that I could send, I sent them to Bob Weston at Chicago Mastering. Oh, yeah. Because cool. he, mm -hmm. Bob does, or he, he does a great job at, they did such a great job with so many other artists that I really admired uh, yeah. in their catalog as, as, far when, as far as cutting electronic music to vinyl, which can be really yeah. tricky, as you guys know. Um, so I sent them my masters of my digital masters of what i would like it to sound like and then i sent them the unmastered versions mm -hmm. so that bob had a reference um and then i sent him some pictures of some of the mastering gear that i use because i think they had some of the same <laughs> they had some of the same mastering equipment that i had like the mask like mpl2 and yeah. this, we had the same limiter and i believe they have the mea2 as well same. EQ. That's... So I used some of the same gear. So I sent some pictures of my settings of that. And I told them, like, that's kind of what I use. Yeah. If you guys feel that you want to make changes for it to work better for vinyl, I'm totally happy. Yeah. I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, they did always, a great job. There's always a, a few things that uh, I think play a role when you're vinyl uh, cutting and vinyl yeah, mastering. Yeah, especially with low end. Yeah, that's the low end, pan, low end, and um, yeah, certain hiss. It's volume, you know, hiss and, and mixes. And low end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's hard to get those to translate and it to yeah. sound loud. But it's cor of course, yeah. like we were talking earlier, if you're going over 20 minutes, yeah. the grooves get cut tighter and you're you're losing yeah. volume at that point. So it was the tricky balance of trying to get all that to work perfectly so that the volume, uh, the the record yeah. had a good like sound to it because I wanted this record to be a, a fun record where people who like abstract brain dance idea music could enjoy it but also people that like kind of clubby dancey acid kind yeah. of like techno music could enjoy it as well because it has mm. more it's kind of a, more of a fun clubby record for me if, yeah, if that I mean, means something <laughs> I mean everything you just said ex explains everything <laughs> that I heard <laughs> Uh, when I when you let me listen to the to these four tracks, um, actually, mm -hmm. because I thought compared to to your uh, to the record before Sword Life, I, I thought it sounds more nervous. It's it's in general much faster. It's mm -hmm. more transparent. It's not mm -hmm. overwhelming when it comes to you know sonic complexity, and the fact that some exactly. tracks are like four and a half minutes, and and I think the longest one is around eighteen minutes. This all That's right. to me to me seemed like you it. it it came from session work or from like a live improvisation that what was captured and then probably uh, turned into something else from that uh, point. 
but exactly. um, yeah, very, uh, very interesting for, for me to, to hear how, how, how you explain. Yeah, <laughs> it's because, been, yeah, it's been a pleasant surprise. Yeah. A lot mm -hmm. of people were, a lot of my friends that I sent the record to were, were really loving us. Uh, Speedy J had written me back. He, he really liked a lot of my friends that play techno stuff. I got contacted by Richie Houghton and some other people <laughs> in the techno world. They were like, oh my God, this yeah, is yeah. cool that you're making acid. And uh, it's a lot of, it was a big surprise for a lot of people because I, yeah. I hadn't made acid music in 25 years. It's been 20, yeah, 25 years since I made yeah. acid music. So I don't know what compelled me to decide that this year was going to just be the year that I would play at play out live acid music. But I just, you know, I just thought it'd be really fun to do something different, yeah. but revisit a sound from my childhood that really influenced me, but put a new twist on it today, like do something yeah. a little different and use yeah. more modern equipment, um, using more modern sequencers and, and, and making that style of music with my, the mindset of today and see yeah. what, what happened um so it was really like an experiment uh more than anything for myself which yeah. was just fun to yeah. just try um and it sounds really great in a yeah. live situation on a yeah. like a really big pa system these tracks really really um really sing you know um mm. that's really really where they were meant to be played at so um yeah. but it turned out either way to be a fun record um the whole process like you said was um it was really, it was really interesting for me. You know, like I said, I limited the set of tools to only what I could take on an airplane. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, going back to the whole idea of like, all right, yeah. I, you know, I have so many tools here in my studio. I could have used anything really. I could have used <laughs> walls of gear and tons yeah. of effects and things, but I was like, you know, I know I want to limit it to just like five or six pieces of equipment mm -hmm. and, you know, go no, keep the track counts like no bigger than eight or nine tracks, keep it really minimal and see if I could really make an interesting, fun, abstract dance record with a you know, very, very small tool set, but, yeah. and, and then push the, push the limits of what those pieces of kit could do. And yeah, it's a classic uh, approach, I think to, to limit yeah. your, in your means and to make the best out of the few things that you actually select. Exactly. Yeah. I think that the, the, the having too many options can be sometimes a bad thing. Like I feel that, you know, I think a person like when people look at my studio, they're like, Oh my God, he's got every piece of gear in the world. And it's like, I don't really think that's a great thing. You know I mean? I, I do. Yes. I do have a lot of gear and I, a lot of the gear that I've gotten is only because I've worked with so many companies designing sounds for their synths and they would just give me the synth. Um, and I always keep every synth that I've worked on for any company just because, um, I was forced to learn that synthesizer and be, because I've learned that synthesizer so well, I can work quickly with it. And when I'm working on projects like my own music or if I'm working for content for other companies, I can, um, I don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, figure out that synth because I already know how to use it. Yeah. So it's almost like I have a library of all these great synths that I've created sounds for that um, I can yeah. just reach out and grab and work really really efficiently and, and yeah. fast with so um, i was i was wondering about that i was wondering whether um you know the the work that you do as a sound designer for corporate um and how far that changes your approach to when you get back to your own records and to your own music if there are some core experiences or core learnings you when you're working in in the field of ambisonics and 360 degree recording uh, in very different contexts if that's that's ha that has an effect um, over, over your personal uh, music absolutely um both both of them go hand in hand in interesting ways i think when i've worked doing a lot of like corporate client work usually my task is to enhance the user's experience with audio in some way. Um, and it could be, you know, enhancing the audio in some iOS app. It could be, um, it, like you said, it could be a virtual reality environment using VR or a VR based app with uh, Ambisonics audio, or it could be a video game. I've worked for a lot of video games. Um, yeah. I think most recently the yeah was the Cyberpunk 2077 game coming out soon. We did I did a lot of work with them on that with CD Projekt Red, but um, or it could be the car. You know, we did the contest with the Jaguar. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. working with them. So it's, it's these 
it could be really anything. Um, and usually what I do is I try to use sound to articulate uh, in those environments and those type of projects, I have to utilize sound design and, and sort of like the sounds have to articulate. It's almost like a language where it's communicating specific ideas or states that the device or system is in or convince the user that you're experiencing some sort of uh, phenomena that's happening like with the VR stuff I was responsible yeah. for like all of the user interaction sounds but I was also had to create uh, a large amount of content where say you were at the uh, the ocean or at the beach um, and they were they had you know this virtual reality image of you being on the sand at the beach but I would have to recreate that mm. sonically oh I mm. had to create the picture of you um, the 360 degree um, spatialness of like the wind blowing, seagulls flying above you, mm. you know, you can hear the ocean waves in front of you, all the spatialized positioning of all the sounds that had to be very realistic. And, and so if you didn't even have the visual sense, you just had the headphones on, you could tell, okay, I'm, I'm at the ocean, I'm at the beach, I'm very close to the water. I, there's all this information that you could get, even if you didn't have yeah. the visual. Um, so it's really interesting. Yeah, like you're, my job um, is almost like telling a story a lot. You know, it's like yeah. you're telling a story to people with just sound, which is really fascinating to me how much information you can give people with just yeah. with just sine waves <laughs> or audio, you know, just audio yeah. vibrations. I was always wondering because they, I mean, this is the 360 degrees world and now the, the record is a stereo uh, yeah. <laughs> artwork again. So, and then in between, I think somewhere in between there is the, the whole field of sound installations and, and uh, where you can actually work with many channels and, and, and probably uh, this, this could be something I think that would make a lot of sense to see from you if I wouldn't, I would not be surprised to see like a, a, a really big sound installation in some big city uh, to, to, from, from your side, actually. Somehow that would be totally fun. I would yeah. love to work on um, installation work at some point, yeah. whether it's, um, you know, multi-channel installation stuff. Yeah. I've done spatialized shows where I, I have played, um, I think I think the most most amount of speakers I've played on was 20, 20.8, was a 20.8 surround Amazing. system in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've done various other spatialized shows at festivals mm. and stuff um, mm. in Europe and, and yeah. Holland. And I've always loved that format. Yeah, me too. Just, it's really, really big in, in Europe too. There's, there's also yeah. some funding some really interesting artists. Something I'm, I'm super interested in. Also, trying to find ways to bring uh, my company um, into that world more. Um, yes. A, a year ago, we sold like a whole bunch of uh, small monitors to the Technical University in Berlin. They have a an ambisonics um, space as well and they have a fully functioning oh, cool. wave field synthesis um, oh yeah wave field synthesis well. yes and nice. no, it's, it's, that's that that stuff is really really interesting for me and uh, i remember you telling me that uh, w when you got like a, a type 30 a midfield monitor from us that this mm -hmm. was supposed to uh, get into like uh, your your own private uh, ambisonic space <laughs> yes it's it's we are um they are the type 30s are my main monitors in my studio b room right now which mm -hmm. we're, we're still in the process of converting to a dolby atmos system oh okay Thank you. <laughs> um yeah. so we're trying to build these custom tracks on the ceiling right now so we could hang some smaller speakers above and then but the mains are the type 30s for right for like right now they're um the biggest one, the biggest guys in the room. Um, and they, like I said, they sound great. I love the type thirties, like as far as, um, it's just such a, I, I, it's the first ribbon tweeter speaker I've ever owned, mm -hmm. um, which is um, completely different than any other speaker that I've, I've ever used, which has such a, I don't know how to describe it, but the high, the mid to high end, it's so yeah. pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's not harsh. Like, I don't yeah. know how to describe it, but it's yeah, like, yeah. it has such a, the way that it, it just sounds, it has such a pleasurably smooth, silky, mm -hmm. um, you could just listen to it for hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was really surprised. I was like, wow, why, I don't know why I didn't try a ribbon tweeter 
a design speaker before. I just never had experience with it. I didn't realize how much of a difference it would make, but it was it made it made a huge difference. Yeah, I um, think um, one of one of the main things that we did when we started this company was sitting down and try to get that. Um, uh, it's actually an air motion transformer. It's comparable the, the, uh, to a ribbon in in terms of material and in terms of. Uh, what material material is used to actually push the air or to move the air, but the mm -hmm. way it works is is a little different because as opposed to a ribbon tweeter that will always, you know, it's like a diaphragm that pushes the air back and forth. And forth. W within these air motion transformers, you have all these little folds that kind of squeeze and by that accelerate the air, oh, and that makes okay. it very good for transient response and for everything that you know has fast transients and short attack material and oh, okay and uh, in the atom years when when we were behind atom audio there was still uh, i thought that with some models the the emotion transformer sounded a little too bright to my personal tastes and mm. um, so when we started head we tried to find ways and applied lots of different things to um actually get the distortion of the tweeter down quite significantly and to make it mm -hmm you know, as detailed as possible, but not as, um, you know, not as an exciter, like, but, but you know, more natural sounding in, in, in general. Exactly. And, and it's the same tweeter that we use in all sorts of models. Like, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a small model or a big one, like the Type 30, even the big tower mains that we have, have the exact same. Um, the same tweeters form, that. Same tweeters. Yeah, I've noticed that, that the high end and the mid range and the high end is just so, it's just so mm -hmm. nice. It's, I, I don't know how to, how to explain it, but yeah. you can just listen to it. You don't get ear fatigue, um, you know, like some of the other speakers I have here. Like, I can't listen to them for, for a super long time without getting ear fatigue. Yeah. I'm surprised yeah. that, that you could spend long hours. Would you say that there is a comparable sonic uh, signature uh, between the, um, the Type 30s and the headphone? I know it's a far stretch, but is there any, would you say there's it's, something? It's interesting that I feel that they have the um, a very similar sound. It, it's like I don't know how to describe it, but there's more. The the best way I can describe that the head, the because um, you're using also the air air, the air motion transformer. It's the same principle. Technology, but, same prin principle yeah, with the headphones. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's so much more intimate with the headphones like with the speakers obviously the sounds traveling through the through the room to you so you're getting the the, the acoustic sounding of the properties of the room reflections of the walls and things are all yeah. are playing in part of the audio experience but when i've worn the headphones it's it's like i'm in my own i don't know how to describe but i'm in like my own perfectly room treated like hi-fi listening room or something you know like where it's yeah. just it's just like cushy, comfy, and the sound is completely like in my head. Mm. Like, and it's just, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, um, I've been listening to those, those headphones so much lately that it's, um, yeah, I was just telling you, I've been listening to the new Autechre album on, on, the, on the new headphones, and it's just, it's incredible. Just the richness, the, the textual <laughs> mid-range yeah mm. like that you can hear in those headphones is just remarkable like mm. you guys really just it's just like audio bliss <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's actually you know the, I mean? yeah it's 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 a huge device because it's you know it's only ma made with the idea of of getting the, the the best sound possible for us possible based on that technology and uh, that's why it's a little big. It's a little bit on the heavy side, but hopefully not too heavy. Um, and I think we made it quite comfortable um, for the, the fact that it's it's quite a quite a heavy device. But the the yeah. fact that it's so big on the ear and almost makes me look like a Mickey Mouse or something. <laughs> it actually has something yeah. to do with the staging and the depth of the sound and the stereo imaging is very much related oh, man. To, to the it's geometries of the of the headphone. Yeah. Yeah, I personally, you know, I, I, I have the HD800S headphones, which were my first, like, I would say, like, my first entry headphones to, like, the hi-fi headphone world. But mm. the head, your guys' headphones to me is just, just sounds far superior in the quality. I mean, they're also uh, open back headphones. They're not a closed yeah. system. So I get a lot of yeah. outside sounds that come in. And so it kind of, yeah. it's, 
you know, not ideal in a lot of situations when you want to do like really critical listening. Maybe if you're doing editing or something, I feel like mm -hmm. they're okay headphones for that. But like, since I've gotten your, the, the headphones, um, uh, it's just, yeah, it's just pure audio bliss. Like it's like my, my favorite, you know, headphone for listening to music. And I've actually been using it a lot for like, um, I used it for mastering too. I used it for my record too, to listen to, um, listen to the stereo imaging and the depth mm. of everything in the mixes and just to make sure that it sounded good. Uh, yeah. It was the, it was the main headphones I used to reference uh, my last acid record. Mm. Um, Cause I actually, you know, had something else besides my Sennheisers, which was just good for referencing, but I feel like I'm getting a more accurate picture with, with your yeah. headphones, if that yeah. makes sense. It seems more yeah. accurate to me. Yeah. Um, and that, it's that's... very natural too. There's yeah. not much bass in the eight, the Sennheisers. Well, I don't know. If why yeah, that it's going is, lower but... definitely goes a little lower um yeah so... i feel that the uh that your that your headphones have much more of a more accurate bass representation of what's really in the music mm -hmm. to me when i was doing side by side comparisons so i've been mm -hmm. using these uh, um your headphones um yeah. over the sennheisers um for pretty much everything lately mm -hmm. even for personal listening because just listening to stuff on them is just yeah it's just so amazing so i still I love spending... it so much like, yeah even with it's all the amazing. qc and with all the the development phase and like it's i i still like to have my pair at home and to listen to to music at home with uh... it's, it's just so fun to listen to music on yeah. i mean i yeah, get yeah. that's the whole point you know yeah and that's how it <laughs> started people... that's definitely yeah, how it started i, mean, I think the, the first wave of, of people interested in the headphone were actually people coming from the um kind of hi-fi like a modern hi-fi world um mm -hmm. and people who are really in, in the best possible way like years lots times thousand like obsessed <laughs> obsessed with <laughs> headphones obsessed with i love those I, I know because I'm, I'm a member of headfi too yeah, I'm sure that, that kind of that. world yeah and yeah, i have to say I, I wasn't really aware of this this world until like two years ago i i got because of, of chris who you who you also know Uh, mm -hmm. who joined us from from Odyssey actually and he that's um, right yeah he kind of you know he he came and then he he told us about head fight told us about the can jam shows and and we were like exactly, wow there's yeah. a whole now we finally understand where this product is supposed to be in the beginning because we we, we built it because we wanted to do it and we we thought we have a have a great shot but we weren't 100 um sure where the product would actually belong at the end of the day and then uh, like three months ago we had a, a cover on the sound on sound and then it mm -hmm. it slowly now it's crawling into into the heads of a lot of mastering engineers i think and, oh, and that's awesome produce at home so it's becoming a pro audio relevant um product as well which me makes me happy on a very personal level because that's my background obviously yeah yeah i mean it's it i feel it's perfectly suited for that for that environment um you know because i used it <laughs> i used it to reference and master for my last album so i'm sure mm. other people That's are using awesome. it too. It's, it's such a great tool you know yeah. yeah um and like i said i have my pair right next to my desk over here yeah, just yeah. sitting yeah. over there on the on the yeah. uh, stand right yeah. there See you um too. i got me a little headphone kind of thing to keep them because i reference stuff all the time that's that's my main main editing uh computer so i spend a lot of hours editing back there and so i'm always doing yeah, like yeah. quick headphone checks on stuff just to make sure things are good in the stereo image and the field and the depth of everything and yeah the headphones have been just so i don't know like wow. i remember the first time i heard music through them it was like breathtaking just, yeah it just thanks so much it's, it's yeah um, that means a lot and for us especially for me my father um and uh, dimitri is, who works in, in research and development too in, in berlin we the first time we heard the headphone based on a technology that was always a tweeter since the late 90s it was or mid 90s even it was a tweeter and then listening to that tweeter <laughs> doing stuff around like 10 15 hertz or something was really fascinating it was like a defining yes. moment i think for the entire project to that showed us that it's actually possible you know one of the one of the i think most striking strength of the headphone is something that you i consider to be of crazy importance for your records as well and that's the mm -hmm. the the whole um 
field of working with reverbs and working with delays. Um, because I think even if you're, the new record sounds very different compared to the earlier records, there's still this overlaying um, sophistication when it comes to using reverb and when it comes to using delays. Mm -hmm. And I heard that in the new record as well. There's so, there are so many different levels of working with reverb, even on that little, you know, that record that is, uh, was very fascinating for me. You know, every thing yeah. has, its, has its room and its space. And, and I think it's a, it's a great art and a great accomplishment from you to, to make sure that it's not smearing and that everything is so, so perfect to perceive, I think, even with all these different layers of, of a delay. Yeah, yeah I, lo I love using effects in really creative ways. And on this record, I used uh, a special modular. Uh, it's a module that's a Eurorack module that's made by Northern Modular is the okay. name of the company. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to control the H9 processors with control voltage ah, and MIDI okay. as well. So you can, mm -hmm. um, you can use up to eight or 10 like um, parameters that you can modulate within each pedal. And I have one, I have their bigger one for my H9000. So I can do macro MIDI control assignments. I could control it with a Buchla. I could control it with a, um, you know, a Eurorack modular with control voltages that I actually that have a whole designated rack yeah. for modulating all of the H yeah. H9000 algorithms, which yeah. can get really crazy because you find all these sweet spots when you have opposing bipolar patterns moving around and automating things just in a couple seconds. So it's not like you have to set up a bunch of automation stuff in the computer or, or you know, set up a controller. I just have a, a, a rig that's already got all this stuff happening and I just take a couple of cables and uh, all this stuff starts happening. And yeah. I did a very similar thing with the record where I used their smaller um, Eurorack module version for the H9 yeah. effects unit. So I was able to do things where like, if I wanted the reverb to swell up at a certain point, I could get yeah. it right before a build would happen and then take it all the way and it's clean. Yeah. Or I could have a sequencer sequencing things mm. irregularly where mm. like you might have like a reverb, like it'll like um, a throw, I call it a reverb throw where you might hear a snare, like mm. a yeah and it would suck back and yeah. yeah yeah so i could do all of these really cool things um with control voltage signals um mm. using my sequencers and then i mm. could do things that would happen on time or i could make them you know organically build or you know move with uh with the pieces of music yeah. even the delays as well so um, it happens a lot on the just, record happens a lot like it modulating lot, yeah. reverbs and playing mm -hmm. around with these with the way they they change over time is this over time exactly. definitely a repeating it, element <laughs> yes yes i just mm -hmm. i just love doing that especially live i yeah. love doing that thing that very thing if i'm performing uh out uh, you know doing shows and stuff it's a fun element to, to kind of play with and i did a bit of that when i was you know recording uh, recording this record so um but yeah, it's fun. It's it's funny to notice that because that's definitely something that I enjoy doing yeah. Um, yeah. throughout the throughout the pieces. Yeah, that's that's yeah. I wanted to mention that because it's <laughs> it's quite a striking element, I think, of your music <laughs> in general. Mm -hmm. um, great. So what I wrote down is it's the record is going to come out on November eleventh. And that's right. I saw yep. uh, I saw uh, a tape and I saw a vinyl and they will obviously be yes. digital. So um, how how is it how is it going with the release? Like what do you what do you expect? Um, I mean, obviously live shows won't be possible for a while, I guess. But I guess they're a part of the master plan. Yeah, we um, yeah we we set the record to it was pre order on October second. And yeah, so you, you uh, November 11th is the release date. Um, this record is sort of a, an experiment for us because um, we're kind of doing it as a, like a, like a self-release. I'm releasing it on my friend's label, Black Noise, but we're really kind of doing it all ourselves. Like we were releasing the vinyl ourselves. We opened up a merch store as well. So we have some t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. And then- wow. um, we set up a whole separate business account just to study the analytics to see how much money we, how much more money we would make as opposed to going through a record label. Cause I've always released mm -hmm. through a label. So this is kind of an experiment to see now 
in 2020, how relevant is it to have a record label? If we pay for the, our own PR yeah. promotions and we do some distribution deals with some companies to get the record out in certain countries and mm. stuff, um, you know, is it better to go with the record label or is it better just to do it yourself now, especially now with social media and the way things are, we have, we have all these things um, like discord and things where you can directly connect and interact with your fans. Mm. It does it, is the old record label model even relevant yeah. ever, anymore? So yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out right now and see what I'm going to do for like the next two or three albums. If I'm going to still continue releasing them with a traditional record label, or if I'm going to try to use this newer model where I'm doing all of those things ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's basically what this record is kind of a, an experiment in trying to see what happens. So I'm, curious to see where it'll go but yeah it's so far it's been selling really well we um we did limited edition um wax image vinyl and test pressing vinyls those all sold out less than five minutes um so we had a lot of people that were bummed out we might do a repress on those and we're already almost sold out on the regular vinyl right mm -hmm. now so Very cool. and it hasn't even been released yet so we're thinking we might have to repress um yeah once it goes live on november 11th just judging by the sales yeah. so far we we yeah. didn't realize it would be uh this much interest in it especially during covid i didn't know how many people would even be buying music right now so i know a lot of people are yeah you know probably not in the best financial situations um during this period and i'm sure music is probably on the lower end of priorities for people <laughs> buying things right now yeah um, i thought so, so too but but what i what i hear a lot actually from dealers um that's you know sales of musical instruments synthesizers really went up like crazy and um the same yes. goes for actually for headphones because you know a lot of people are at home they they um, think they're in a, in a difficult situation, so they're trying to make the best out of it and, and probably use some of that extra time to be creative, um, to, li to listen to more music. Yeah. So we exactly. really feel, feel it going down and we, we got lots of interest in the, in the COVID day, days, exactly, especially with the, with the headphone. Um, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And the other thing you said is, I mean, I see so many more brands uh, comparable in size to us that are, you know, slowly turning into the whole e-commerce um, business, being dealers of their own products and, you know, going that last step uh, away from, from classical distribution model. It's kind of a comparable situation, actually, because... The same for us. We're getting tons of messages every day through Facebook, through Instagram, from people who have all sorts of questions, technical questions, questions with regards to dealers, where they can find speakers, where they can listen to speakers, if they can get a demo or like an artist discount, all these kind of things. And it, it seems more than ever, it seems so natural to just... And, you know, not send them away to to a different <laughs> to a different company to actually buy it, but to actually you know take care of that yourself as the brand, as the 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 right probably right place. So there's absolutely a big change compared to like ten or twenty years ago, where this wasn't really um, a thing, at least in exactly. our little market. Yeah. Exactly, I feel like the market has changed so much, and yeah. like how people advertise and get the word out is so different now, and yeah with the whole way that we do things on the internet with like social media the whole yeah. way of how just everything gets you know how information gets to people is now so different it's like immediate you know yeah. you can reach so many people so quickly so it, it yeah. it's definitely i know from coming from the record industry working for over 25 years mm -hmm. how we used to have to do things <laughs> it was seems yeah. it yeah. seems archaic the way we used to have to do stuff mailing you know, CDs out to all the magazines and radio yeah, exactly. press people like we yeah. had to do. It was a lot of hand labor stuff. Now everything's digitized and automated and, you know, we're living in a different age. So it's, uh, it's, it's even for me, it's a lot to, to learn and to experience. And my wife yeah. has been helping me too. She's helping us with all the, I've let her basically take over the band camp store. So she's I running see. all the orders and uh, yeah. Okay. doing all the invoice like handling all the account information and like the shipping and stuff she's really had a lot of fun doing all that <laughs> so i said hey you can you can run off with that that'll be your project so it's yeah. been yeah. it's been a lot of fun 
yeah. yeah. So we've been really enjoying it. And we get in with this record. It's going to be great. I've been putting like a personal thank you card at every release, mm -hmm. every vinyl release and, uh, and every, uh, uh, you know, every purchase that was made to, ha it's nice to be able to have like some personal touch that you give to that fan. So it feels yeah, more of great. like a personal yeah. thing rather than it just being something that you get from a label that just, you know, cut ships from some warehouse and there's no personal yeah. connection from the artist to yeah. the fan. But I wanted it, this to feel a little bit different. And, and, and like I said, I also want that to be the experiments to see how it feels like to put that personal touch in with this release. So I'm, I'm really curious to see <laughs> how it, how it goes, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll maybe. see. We'll see. Hopefully, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll do well. Uh, but I think, I think it will just judging by the numbers from what we've seen, um, you know, from our band camp stats and stuff and, and all that through all the orders have been really, really, uh, been really good. So I got to say that we, uh, been pretty happy mm. <laughs> so far. That <sounds> good. <laughs> I think it's going to go. Okay. <laughs> no, definitely wishing you all the best of luck for this. It's, um, it's amazing to hear. Yeah. It's been yeah. fun. <laughs> I'll, we'll buy one, the company. I need to buy a turntable for the company first. But <laughs> oh no, we'll send you one. We'll send you one. No, no need to to buy one. We have yeah. plenty. We could we could give you for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we do I'd have a lot of to see what you... electronic music um, loving people in the company on all levels. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. That is great. So well. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, thank you. This was yeah, really Richard, great. Thank it's, you so much. It's the beginning for us. We were bringing the whole marketing, branding kind of thing to the next level at the moment. And uh, part of that is uh, that I, I would love to make, you know, be more in conversations with people from within the industry and from the artist side of things. And um, in a way, um, you are the first experiment. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. great. I love being the first experiment awesome. and, and and many thing and anything that deals with audio stuff and you know um, yeah oh i should always m mention that in here that we're giving a pair of your headphones away yeah uh, of course oh my god yeah for for the uh, for everybody that uh, that places an order um whatever that is whether it's a tape or vinyl or digital download they're going to go into a uh, we have basically this system where we've been tracking every person's name in the system we're going to do a random draw yeah. on uh the end we're gonna probably do it probably the next day after november 11th after we've got all the okay. people that have done purchase orders and stuff just to make sure that everyone gets yes. a chance yes um and then we're gonna we're gonna d draw a, a drawing for a pair of the headphones because uh yeah, yeah. i think it's a perfect gift because man this yeah i can't think of more of an awesome gift to get than a <laughs> super incredible rolls royce pair of amazing headphones it sounds yes. just in insanely amazing so yeah should, we should throw that out there uh, for people watching this that you know more incentive to check out and buy uh, something and yes. and win a pair of awesome headphones <laughs> yeah we put we put the information in the um in the text description uh below the video and we'll post about it in the next days Ooh. as well okay. yeah excellent. excellent great so richard thank you so much thank you so much. Uh, anytime absolutely it's been a pleasure an absolute always pleasure. My wife, my, my face got paler and paler because the sun is rising down. So <laughs> <laughs> I had more color in my, my face, actually. Okay. The sun is Easy. coming out. Have a good one. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Cheers. Ciao.